Hi, I didn't really want to record today because my stomach hurts and I'm really tired, but I could not resist explaining concepts of physics to you guys. So here I am talking about the flat earth again. Let's just dive into it. Um, how about the problem with the east-west on a globe, as I showed last week, or... I think I found what he's talking about, and in it, he explains that uh, if you were to constantly travel eastward or westward, then you would have to be constantly uh, turning in order to stay in that eastward or westward direction. It's a bit tough for me to explain, but uh, I'll put it this way. Uh, on any particular point in a parallel, that's a, a line of latitude, uh, the parallel goes east to west, but the parallel itself is curved. So in order to be constantly traveling east, you'd have to be traveling a curved path as the parallel curves. Does that make sense? Not only does he fail to realize that this exact same thing would happen on a flat earth because parallels are still curved on the common flat earth map, but it doesn't seem like he's actually arguing against anyone because nobody's saying that this isn't the case. In fact, this has been a known phenomenon for a very long time. And that's why, as I pointed out in a previous video, uh, flights that are taken within the northern hemisphere take a path that is curved on a flat map further north than you might expect. And that's because that's the shortest distance on the globe shape of the Earth. But what's even more damning is that this exact same thing happens in the southern hemisphere, except that the path is curved farther south than you would expect, which is perfectly consistent with the globe Earth, but this would not be the case on the flat Earth. I'm trying to think of these off the top of my head. I don't know. Uh, Coriolis. We have a problem with Coriolis. It does not exist on a spinning planet with an attached spinning atmosphere. Wouldn't make any sense. Well, our atmosphere isn't completely attached. And you know, because of that, the Coriolis effect actually causes certain winds. And those winds affect the ocean currents on the surface. Uh, the ocean undercurrents are also mostly affected by the Coriolis effect as well. Same thing with uh, not only that, but the Coriolis effect in conjunction with, you know, pressure gradients and stuff, those cause hurricanes and cyclones to form. So without the spin of the earth, we would have no hurricanes and us here in Louisiana would be pretty happy. But the reality is we experience hurricanes because we're on a spinning ball and I live on the Gulf Coast for some reason. We also experience the Utvush effect, where the Coriolis force and centrifugal force cause us to weigh more when traveling westward and less when traveling eastward, which wouldn't happen on a flat Earth. We have no evidence of a gas atmosphere without a container. Uh, yeah, we do and you live in it. It's not about a container. It's about a force that keeps the atmosphere where it's at. Now, in a container, that force is applied by the, the walls of the container, but here on Earth, that's gravity. Now, proving the existence of gravity is going to take way longer than I have right now, uh, but I'll tell you what, I'll put it this way. You believe in buoyancy, right? Well, buoyancy requires gravity, because buoyancy only works when there's a gradient of pressure in a fluid, and that can only be caused by gravity. So maybe I'll dive deeper into that in another video. I've talked about it before. Let's keep moving. Or no proof of a 93 million mile distant sun. Look at my video called Scaling Indifference, telling us that we can adjust the sizes and distances and the observation remains the same from Earth because it remains the same angular size. The video that I think he's talking about is almost 20 minutes long, so I'm not going to respond to those claims, at least not yet. Not here. Not now. Uh, but uh, as far as what he actually said in this video, I'm not going to go too in-depth because I don't have to. Counter argument, here is a picture of a mountain casting shadows on clouds. And well, here is a picture of the same mountain with the sun above it. So how does the sun go from being above the mountains to below the mountains if the sun is a constant height above the entire surface of the Earth? 
Well, it can't, but this does make sense on a rotating globe Earth. And this happens with just about every mountain, not just this one. Or the idiots like Brian Cox, who actually said, and I quote, nobody in human history, as far as I know, has thought that the world was flat. He goes on about this for minutes, and yes, this was a very stupid thing to say. But notice how he said, as far as I know. That tells me that, at least in that moment, he couldn't recall any. And as a physicist, he probably never needed to look up ancient concepts of the Earth. And even if he did at one point, he probably didn't remember them. At any rate, you're focusing on the wrong thing. Of course it's easy to uh, attack someone for saying something dumb. But in this very same interview, he actually gives a couple of good reasons for believing in the globe Earth. I cannot conceive of a reason why anybody would think that the world is flat. There are interesting bits of physics that tell you that you live on a spinning planet. Um, one of them is called the Coriolis force, which is the force that's responsible for causing storm systems to rotate on the planet. So when you see those beautiful pictures of storms spinning around and rotating, the reason for that is that we live on a spinning planet. So the, the, the very simple fact that we've taken pictures of it. Whether he's right or wrong about anyone in history believing in the flat earth, that's not the part that actually matters. The part that matters is the reasons that he has and the reasons that he gives for believing in a globe Earth. But instead of attacking those, instead of attacking the genuine reasons someone would believe in a globe Earth, you attack the uh, easy, low-hanging fruit that is ultimately inconsequential. Anything to make yourself seem smarter, I guess. But or they, they tell you that you can easily see the 240,000 mile distant moon, which is a joke in and of itself. Uh, even though the inverse square law tells us that the uh, light on the moon would be about at a thousand miles from the moon, the light of the moon should be 65,000 times as bright as it is from Earth. Give me a break. It's impossible. Go watch the moon landing films and tell me those guys are standing on something that is 65,000 times as bright as we see it from Earth. No freaking way. It's a lie. It's all a joke. You know, I was trying not to go too in-depth with these explanations uh, for the sake of making them quick and simple, but you're not really making it easy. Uh, but I'll put it this way. You're thinking of it as if the moon is the source of the light, but it's not. The sun is the source of the light, and the moon is just reflecting that. So instead of making these calculations based on the distance between the Earth and the moon, you should be calculating it based on the difference between the Earth and the moon, plus the distance between the moon and the sun. And when you do that, the difference is negligible. So a day on Earth is about as bright as a day on the moon. Not only that, but judging by the shadows in the pictures, the sun wasn't very high in the sky, and that means less light would be hitting the moon's surface. On top of that, they would have adjusted the cameras to the lighting so that everything would turn out just fine. And that's why you can't see the stars in the pictures, because the stars are very, very dim compared to how bright the moon's surface was. So, you can get into, I mean, there's so many more. They didn't bring up the Foucault pendulum, which of course is their proof of the Earth spinning when it wouldn't even possibly work if the atmosphere moved along with Earth. Think, people. Use your heads and think. If there's an atmosphere sitting on a spinning Earth, and the Earth is spinning, and the atmosphere is moving with the Earth, then there is nothing that would be affected on the Foucault pendulum. Except the spin of the Earth, which is kind of the point. It's an example of the Coriolis effect, or the Coriolis force. Okay, let's say that this is the Earth, because this is, this is the only ball that I have. And you're on the North Pole, and you spin, spin. You uh, start up a pendulum, and it's swinging this way, doot, 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 because that's, that's the sound that a pendulum makes. And anyway, this is the direction that it swings, right? There's nothing that inherently would make it swing in any direction. There's nothing that would make it change direction. So it would just keep 
a constant uh, direction, right? But if the Earth is spinning underneath it, then the direction is changing relative to somebody that is stuck on this ball, right? So to them, it would look like it's moving this way. When in reality, the ball is moving underneath the pendulum swing. So it's just swinging like this, like this. From an inertial frame of reference, it's not changing direction. There is nothing that would change its direction. And I guess you're right about that. But we're moving underneath the swinging pendulum, more or less, if it was like perfectly on the North Pole. We're moving underneath it. So that's why it seems to move to us. But in reality, it's staying still. Please use your head. Please don't just trust people who try and tell you that they know what they're talking about, because guess what? They don't. Oh, the irony. Yeah, I, you see, I'm lost for words. It, it's, it's probably the most nonsensical suggestion that a, a thinking human being could possibly make. It is drivel.